a very good uh, morning to everybody here uh, in the room. And if you're watching on YouTube, then a very good morning to you as well. Um, it is Good Friday. Praise God. It's, a, it's kind of a, a bittersweet day, isn't it? Where we're remembering something wonderful, where we're rejoicing, but also it's an incredibly powerfully sad um, thing that we're remembering as well. Um, just a couple of things before we properly begin. Um, given the subject of this weekend uh, being Christ's death and his resurrection, um, there's some leaflets uh, at the back of the room just on the, on the counter. Um, and they just go through these three days in a historical way. So looking at the facts, looking at the information. Um, and uh, Ron Ruth provided these. Uh, there's a few of them at the back that we can take. If you want to give them to someone that you know who isn't a Christian, um, and maybe save a couple for Sunday just in case we can hand some out then as well. But they're really good, so very informative and helpful on, um, on those the, the three days uh, that shook the, shook the world, as it says on the front. Um, one just matter of notices, do also remember tomorrow the clocks go forward. forward. Thank you. They go forward, not backwards. They go forward. So please do um, uh, remember that. No, Sunday they go forward. Sorry, I'm getting myself confused. Tomorrow night, they go forward, but remember it. I don't mind if you sleep in tomorrow, you can do that. But uh, remember it for Sunday so that we gather together at the correct time. Well, with, that, um, with all that ramble uh, done, let me read uh, from a psalm as we start our service this morning. I'm going to read the entirety of Psalm 22. Um, this will become relevant as we get into Mark 15 a little while later. Um, psalm 22, uh, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> For the choir director, according to the deer of the dawn, a psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, yet I have no rest, but you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you. They trusted and you rescued them. They cried to you and were set free. They trusted in you and were not disgraced. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads. He relies on the Lord. Let him save him. Let the Lord rescue him since he takes pleasure in him. It was you who brought me out of the womb, making me secure at my mother's breast. I was given over to you at birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Don't be far from me because distress is near and there's no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong ones of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me, lions mauling and roaring. I am poured out like water. All my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You put me into the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. But you, Lord, don't be far away. My strength, come quickly to help me. Rescue my life from the sword, my only life from the power of these dogs. Save me from the lion's mouth from the horns of the wild oxen. You answered me. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the assembly. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. All you descendants of Israel, revere him. For he has not despised or abhorred the torment of the oppressed. He did not hide his face from him, but listened when he cried to him for help. I will give praise in the great assembly because of you. I will fulfill my vows before those who fear you. The humble will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations will bow down before you. 
for kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules the nations. All who prosper on earth will eat and bow down. All those who go down to the dust will kneel before him, even the one who cannot preserve his life. Their descendants will serve him. The next generation will be told about the Lord. They will come and declare his righteousness to a people yet to be born. They will declare what he has done. And may the Lord bless uh, the reading of his words. Let's stand together and let's sing <clears throat> how deep the Father's love for us. Please do have a seat. And if you have a Bible handy, if you could turn to Mark chapter 15. Uh, We're going to read verses 33 to 39. So it's just those verses surrounding Jesus's final breath. Um, But just to fill in the story while you're turning there. um, This day kind of begun with Jesus uh, having having uh, the Last Supper with his disciples, as as Judas's portrayal of Jesus in the garden, as Jesus goes to the garden and he prays and he sweats drops of blood for what's about to happen. And as he is arrested and then he's put on trial, a ridiculous set of trials, um, he is condemned, given his cross to walk up the hill to and nailed to it. And everyone around him is mocking and making fun of him. And then this is what we get in verse 33. At the sixth hour, 
darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. But we'll return to that passage in a little while after we've sung and prayed and we'll think more about why Jesus died. Let's um, stand and sing again when I survey the wondrous cross. let's um, pray before we open up this section of Mark. Heavenly Father, we come together like this this morning in appreciation and awe of what you have done in giving your son for us. Lord, as we think about the cross, 
as we think about this day over 2,000 years ago in which Jesus sacrificed himself. Lord, we are humbled. Lord, as we look to your word now, please remind us afresh whether we're Christians here this morning or whether we're not. Remind us of why Jesus died. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, if you have uh, Matthew, and uh, sorry, not Matthew, <laughs> Mark 15 open. Great. <clears throat> have you ever uh, read a book or watched a movie where an important character gives their life for someone else? Anyone ever, ever read a book or watched a movie where someone important to the story has given their life for someone else? Yeah, well, most of us, if not all of us, have, have, have kind of seen that before, haven't we? Um, it's, it's a fairly popular theme. In fact, you've probably seen it more than once. Uh, it's popular, and it, it, when it's done right, it hits quite hard, doesn't it? Especially when you've invested in this character and you really like them. Uh, just to give a few examples, and these might uh, betray the kind of person that I am. Uh, Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, uh, when he fights the Balrog and he sacrifices himself so that everyone else can go free. Aslan and the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe sacrifices himself in Edmund's place. Iron Man in Avengers Endgame sacrifice. Yeah, I know I'm getting some laughs. Yeah, Iron Man in Avengers Endgame uh, sacrifices himself to bring many back. Uh, sorry for the spoilers in case you haven't seen or read those things. But we love this in stories, don't we? We love to see this idea, the hero laying down their life for the innocent. And, and even in real life, uh, outside of movies and stories, we respect and we honor those who do the same thing, don't we? So when a firefighter dies uh, trying to save someone, we call them, and rightly so, a hero, don't we? Every November, we have a whole time where we remember those in our armed services who, in our armed forces, sorry, who sacrificed themselves for other people. Because giving your life for someone else is the most precious thing you can do, isn't it? When it happens, we take notice. And so as we come together this morning to think about Jesus' own death, who, who isn't just another human, another person, another good guy um, trying to do something nice, but is, is God's perfect son, it's worth spending the time thinking through this question, why did Jesus die? Since giving your life is such a big deal, and since it's such a massive thing to do, why did Jesus do it? Why did Jesus, God's own son, who never did anything wrong, willingly let himself be crucified and die? And I think in this part of Mark, you get a really clear picture of why he died. In these verses surrounding Jesus' final breath, it becomes clear why Jesus gave his life. It shows us that Jesus died to take our judgment so we can know God. <clears throat> Let's look at that first part of why Jesus died, to take our judgment. Let me read those verses again from verse 33 to 36. At the sixth hour, darkness came over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. One man ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. On the cross, Jesus takes God's judgment and wrath that was stored up for us. He experiences separation and rejection from God so much that it kills him. As Jesus hangs nailed to the cross with soldiers surrounding him, with people mocking him and laughing at him, suddenly there's darkness. This version says it was the sixth hour, but to us that's uh, 12 noon, kind of 12 p.m. Yeah, 12 p.m., uh, noon, mid, middle of the day. For three hours, the entire land in the middle of the day 
just goes dark, as if the sun had been turned off, like it was an eclipse but lasting for three hours. Now, let's just kind of address that. That's not normal behavior for the sun, is it? No. Um, it's, it's not often that the sun just decides, no, not today, and uh, doesn't give out any, any sunshine for three hours. That's, that's, that's not normal, is it? This isn't just overcast. It's not just stormy like you would, you know, maybe see in Scotland. This is supernatural. This is a, a purposeful darkening of the land by God himself. And we know that because this kind, this kind of darkness is mentioned in the Bible a few times. In fact, it's mentioned in this book of Mark earlier on as a sign of God's judgment. Supernatural, sudden darkness is always a sign of God's coming judgment. If we think of the 10 plagues, if you're familiar with the book of Exodus, uh, the 10 plagues that God sent on Egypt because they refused to let Israel go. The second last one, if I've got my memory correct, is darkness. The prophets, um, like Amos, for example, a prophet in the Old Testament, talks about a day when God's going to make it dark at noon. It's a sign of God's judgment. It's a sign of his anger at the world, at our sin at humanity's rebellion and hatred to God. And so as Jesus, God's son, is, is dying on the cross, surrounded by people who want him dead, this physical sign of God's anger and his judgment is happening all around him. The sky itself is screaming that judgment is coming and it's going to be poured out. And if this was a movie... This would be the rescue scene, wouldn't it? This is where the hero has been captured. He's been tortured. Um, he's, death is imminent. But at the very last minute, something changes. Someone rushes in and saves his life. They, he, they break him down and they both defeat all the bad guys. I mean, if you just look at the scene, it's almost asking for it, isn't it? God's beloved son is nailed to a cross and his enemies are almost comically laughing it up. The people who put him there are enjoying every second of his slow, agonizing death. This is prime time for a Hollywood rescue. If we were writing this story, that's how this would end, wouldn't it? And it would be so right for that to happen. It would make a lot of sense for God's anger and his wrath and his judgment to fall on those people who have done this to God's son. And this idea gets bigger when Jesus opens his mouth. After three hours of this darkness, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is quoting a psalm here, which is the psalm that we read out at the start of our, our time together, Psalm 22. And Jesus quotes the first line of the psalm. Um, and and as, uh, he doesn't quote the full thing, but everybody who's listening, the Jews who are listening and us who are reading it, were meant to understand that Jesus is pointing to Psalm 22 just before he dies. It's sort of like if I was to say to you this morning, uh, hark the herald, angels sing, or away in a... I didn't even have to finish it. Could have, this could have been anything. Um, you, you, you don't actually think I'm talking about harking a herald or whatever the correct phraseology is for that or talking about where I'm going to be sleeping tonight. Because we share a culture, we, we understand those songs. You know that when I say that, those songs jump into your head. You know I'm talking about those songs. Now, I'm sorry if they're in your head for the rest of the day. Uh, and Jesus is doing something similar. By quoting just that first line of the psalm, he's pointing to it as important. And as we read it earlier, you might have noticed those incredible connections. This is written, and that Psalm 20 is written hundreds of years before Jesus. And you may have noticed those connections yourself. We can't go into all of them, but to give a quick rundown, the Psalm talks about a king, King David, who was surrounded by his enemies, like Jesus was, with people mocking him, just like Jesus was, with his hands and his feet being pierced. Now, whether David actually has had his hands and feet pierced or whether he felt just was giving it as an illustration of how constrained he felt, uh, Jesus did physically, really, literally feel that. 
people selling his belongings. It's exactly what was happening to Jesus at the bottom of the cross as the soldiers were gambling over his belongings. This psalm is all about David crying to God to please save him. And God does save David. By the end of the psalm, you see David leading worship to God. He's got his people, his, his, his Jewish uh, brothers and sisters, and he's leading worship with them. And he's also leading worship for people who are foreign and, and aren't Jewish as well. And the point here is that Jesus is going through something similar to what David went through. In fact, Jesus is going through the, the real thing. He too is surrounded, he's pierced, he's mocked, and he too is a king. He's God's king. And so as we read that, though, that phrase, that, those words, why have you forsaken me? <clears throat> We're meant to be thinking that God, the last time we heard this, God did save the king. Even though he felt like God had left him, well, he, he hadn't. God did actually save David. And so we have this darkness. We have, we have God's judgment kind of looming, waiting, about to come. And then we have Jesus' words here, which kind of point towards the idea of a king being rescued by God. So we've got God's judgment coming and Jesus crying out for help. And the scene maybe makes us think, God's going to save Jesus. Now, you all know the story and you know how it ends. But if you're just reading this as you go, the scene makes us think, God's going to save Jesus here, just like he did with David when he called out these words. And we might think now, okay, this, this really is now the perfect time for a rescue. God's done it for David, he can do it for Jesus. And the Jews around the cross at this time, they, they get a bit interested here, don't they? They start talking about this guy, Elijah, and, and, and waiting to see what's gonna happen. Someone runs and gets, gets a drink and tries to give it to Jesus, and they now all sit and they wait, which is kind of weird behavior. But without going into it too much, they had this belief that Elijah, one of the prophets of the Old Testament who didn't die, would come back and he'd be involved in the rescue of Israel. And so as Jesus cries out for God to save him and rescue him, they all go, oh, hold on. I wonder if anything's going to happen. And they wait. Even they who put him there begin to think, oh, is something about to happen. And then Jesus dies. All of that anticipation, all of that build up, and there's no rescue. <coughs> so what happened? The darkness lifts. Jesus cries out and he dies. And God's judgment doesn't fall on his enemies. He wasn't rescued like David was rescued. Instead, the judgment fell on Jesus. God did forsake him. The wrath and anger at sin that God had stored up for his enemies, Jesus takes it. As he's nailed to the cross and as that darkness surrounds him and as he cries out about God forsaking him, Jesus takes the sin of his people and he dies with it on the cross. And that feels wrong, doesn't it? As you read it. The point that Mark's making is that this is why Jesus died. This is, why, this, this is the true king. God's king. God's son. This is why he died. Because he took the judgment of God on himself that should have instead gone on to his people. See, what killed Jesus ultimately wasn't crucifixion. He was crucified and that would have killed him, but what, it wasn't what ultimately killed him because even later on in this story, Pilate's confused because they go and say Jesus has died and he's surprised that Jesus died so quickly. It should have taken far longer for him to die. It was a slow, agonizing way to die. Ultimately, it wasn't crucifixion that killed Jesus. It was the fact that he took our punishment from God on the cross. Being forsaken by the Father so that we wouldn't be. 
Now, when it comes to heroic deaths, it does not get bigger than that, does it? To willingly allow yourself to be killed, taking a punishment that belonged to someone else is baffling, isn't it? But it gets even better, if that's possible, because Jesus didn't just die to take God's wrath, as if, you know, that's an incredible statement to make, because as if that's not enough, but he died so that we could know God. We see that in these next few verses. Let's read from 37 to 39. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus heard his cry and saw how he died, he said, surely this man was the son of God. When Jesus died, or because Jesus died, anybody can know God anywhere through Jesus. As Jesus breathes his last, Mark seems to become distracted by a curtain. A curtain in the temple is torn from top to bottom. And and, and you might know this story really well. You might know exactly why this has happened. But suspend your disbelief for a second and just take the story as it comes. It's a weird thing to point out as as stories go, isn't it? It'd be a strange scene in a movie. I keep going back to movies, but there we are. Uh, So it'd be a weird scene in a movie, wouldn't it? If you had the hero, right, in this film, the hero has saved everyone and they're now dying and they're doing that really dramatic death scene where, you know, somehow they managed to talk to all of their friends and family before peacefully passing at the exact right moment. But they have this scene where they're, they're, they're dying and eventually they stop talking and close their eyes and the camera's watching this scene and it's full of emotion and it's full of sadness and then the camera suddenly goes like this and looks at the hero's front door and then comes back and never mentions it again. That's weird, right? It's a weird shift from such a powerful emotional scene to something so random. And the reason that Mark's po- Mark points it out is because he, he wants us to connect those two things. He wants us to connect the fact that Jesus has just died with this curtain being ripped. Because it's not just any old curtain. It's a really thick curtain and it hung in the temple. And it separated where God's presence was and where people could approach. It basically contained God's presence into one place behind this curtain. And if you read the Old Testament, people died because they went in there. Because they went in there without permission, without, without being rightly able to do so. Because God, because, sorry, because man can't come near God. Humanity can't get close to God because of our sin. This curtain basically separated God and man away from one another. Making it possible for people at least to get close if not with God and so when it's ripped from top to bottom just as Jesus dies what Mark is saying is that God's not in there anymore the temple's done you don't meet God at the temple anymore he's left it's just a that's just an empty room now because Jesus took the judgment of God for his people you don't go to the temple to meet God so So where do we go? If that temple, if that curtain is ripped and we can't get close to God by going to the temple in Israel, where do we go? Where do we look if we want to know God, if we want to be in a relationship with God? Well, the centurion in this, these last couple of verses, he shows us where our focus should be. Now, this guy is a, he's a Roman military man. He's not Jewish. He would have probably had other gods that he worshipped. He, he was the leader of a hundred men. We know that's, that, that's what centurion means. And he is probably the guy that's in charge of making sure Jesus does not come down from that cross alive. He's probably the one in charge of Jesus' execution. And as this military pagan man looks up at how Jesus dies, he says, surely this was the son of God. It's through Jesus that we know God. This guy was not Jewish. He, he, he didn't 
know God and he wouldn't have even been allowed into the temple properly. Nowhere near that curtain. And yet as Jesus dies, the curtain is ripped and suddenly this random pagan Roman gets who Jesus is when so many people didn't. What Mark is showing us that says that something's changed. Jesus' death has changed things. Something major has shifted and he wants us to see that it's all connected. Now to understand what's going on, we have to go back a little bit to Psalm 22, the Psalm that Jesus quoted while he, just before he died. Now if you remember how it ends, King David has been saved from death and he's leading worship with his people and with foreign people. And although Jesus died where David didn't, the end result has actually been achieved because someone who is not a Jew, who is foreign, is doing something which looks a lot like worshiping God right there. What Mark's getting at by showing us all of this is that anybody can come to God now. Anyone can have access to God through Jesus. Because Jesus took that punishment, because he took that judgment and that wrath. Now anybody from anywhere can know God. We can, get, we can, we can enter into a relationship with our Father because Jesus died for our sin. That's what Mark's showing us in this section. That Jesus in his dying breath has made it possible for mankind to have a relationship with God. This is the kind of hero. This is the kind of king that the gospel speaks about and that we as Christians believe in. One who would give his own life to see humanity and God united. Now, and, and we've said it already, but we see this and we see sacrifice in movies, don't we? where someone gives their life. We see it in superhero films. We see it in fantasy stories time and time again. We see people giving themselves, giving their lives for the innocent. But this is different. Well, for one, because it's real, but also because Jesus doesn't rush in and sacrifice, him for, sacrifice himself for people who love him. He doesn't even sacrifice himself for people who like him or for people who are vaguely on his side. He dies surrounded by people who hate him, for people who've abandoned him, for people who at this moment despise everything about him. And for, in one person's case, for someone who has been charged with actually killing him. Heroes in stories don't often die for their enemies, do they? Kind of be counterproductive to the story, wouldn't it? But in reality, that's exactly what Jesus did. He died to make his enemies his friends and his brothers. And just these few verses about Jesus' death, Mark shows us why Jesus died. He died because he took our punishment so that anyone from anywhere can know God for themselves. Now, the story's not finished, um, of course. Jesus is taken down from the cross. He is buried, and three days later, well, we'll wait for Sunday and let Peter take on from that, won't we? If you really don't know how it ends, I can talk to you afterwards. <laughs> for us today, this morning, um, for the Christian, this passage reminds us that this, this is our king. This is Jesus, the, the, the one who lived and who died for you, who lived and died for me, who lived and died for us. This is what he endured. This is what he suffered. This is the price that he paid. This is the judgment he let himself take in our place so that we get to now call God Father. What a king we have. If you're a Christian this morning, then how can we respond with anything else other than worship? And if you're not a Christian this morning, whether you're in the room, whether you're on YouTube, this passage is showing you the one who can forgive your sin who can bring you into relationship with God, which is the only truly fulfilling relationship. Jesus died so that you, so that you no, no matter who you are, 
no matter what you've done, no matter how good or how bad you think you are, you can be forgiven. And my hope this morning is that by seeing what Jesus did, you would join this Roman centurion in looking at Jesus on that cross as he dies and saying, surely this man was the son of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this incredible picture of your son in the gospel of Mark. We thank you that he took on this judgment and this wrath that we deserved. We thank you that he allowed himself to die, taking all of your anger and all of your hatred towards the the rebellion of, 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 of us. Thank you that he took that on himself and that when he died, he died with it. Thank you that he has made it possible to know you, not by going to a temple and standing behind a curtain, beyond a curtain in another room, but knowing you intimately as our Father. Lord, as we come to sing now, help us to lift our hearts and our souls to you in praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, we're going to sing a song. This is a new song we've never sung before. Uh, Alison has been diligently working to prepare it for us. Uh, And so she's going to uh, lead us through it and help us um, kind of be able to sing it well together. And then we're also going to sing it again on Sunday because it fits the entire weekend so incredibly well. So I'll hand over to Alison's direction. Okay, so if Lee will put the first slide up, please. Um, I'll sing through this first slide and then I'll stop and then we'll start again. Uh, on here you've got two verses and then the chorus. On each subsequent slide there's just one verse and the chorus. Um, and it's by someone I believe Chris knows. Yes, yes. Uh, his, yeah, his name's Ben Slee. Uh, I, went, I, I studied with him last year uh, at, at the seminary that I, I work uh, that, I, that I study at. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's written a few songs so we'll end up seeing his name pop up a few times in the next couple of years I think. <laughs> Anyway, I'll play it through and then I'll um, then we can stand off.
Father, we thank you for the truth of these words and for the truths that we have heard in Scripture this morning. We thank you that because Christ died, our eternity is secure for those who put their faith in Jesus. Lord, we praise you for this truth. And as we go now into um, communion and into prayer time, Lord, would you cause us to rejoice all the more in what your Son has done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So we'll take a small break uh, now, and then uh, we'll come into the next section just very, very shortly. Thank you. 